second thing we're invited to believe that is obviously impossible is that multiculturalism works. Now, it's a very striking thing that five years ago, as Daniel Johnson referred to, Angela Merkel said that multiculturalism had failed. Four years ago, President Sarkozy and Prime Minister Cameron also said that multiculturalism had failed. Yet we as Europeans are invited to believe that when migration was at a relative low point, multiculturalism had failed. Whereas when migration was at such a historic high as it currently is, it could possibly work. This is a very impossible thing to believe. We're also invited to believe that the numbers don't matter, that, uh, that the quantity of people coming in would not in any way particularly affect your society. Uh, there is a figure that I uh, can't help trotting out on such occasions when I hear such things. Um, we are often told in Britain, and I know across Europe people are told, that we are all migrant societies. This is a, a, a not true. It is a, b a bit of casuistry we've been invited to engage in. Uh, but it is true that we have had immigration throughout our history. But if you consider that the largest migration that people still speak about in Britain over recent centuries was four centuries ago when in 16, 1683, in the aftermath of 1683, um, more than 50,000 Huguenots, uh, French Protestants, came to the United Kingdom. Such a large migration that people still talk about it. From 1997 onwards, 50,000 immigrants was about six weeks of average immigration into the UK. So the numbers clearly do matter in some way, and they obviously matter as well because of a density question. Nobody in any of our countries has worked out what to do about, as it were, dispersing people who arrive in such large numbers. And the result in different ways, in Paris, in Germany, and in England and elsewhere, is you effectively get ghettos. Uh, these ghettos are, uh, have all sorts of negative things to do with them, but one which is not noted enough, I would say, but I would give one figure to you that may be relevant, is the extent to which they can cause radicalization themselves. If you go through the figures that my think tank uh, has produced uh, from every single person convicted, not, not, not suspected, but convicted of terrorism-related offenses in the UK, nine out of 10 of those people who have been convicted of Islamic terrorism offenses come from areas where the population is between 25 and 50% Muslim. That is around seven to 10 times the national average. That is not a coincidence, it is a byproduct of a, a density of population. We're also, the fourth impossible thing we're invited to believe is that the identity of immigrants into our societies does not matter. Now, in the UK, in the wake of the atrocities in January in Paris, a, a poll was conducted of British Muslims, which found that 27% of British Muslims had some sympathy with the people who had gone into the offices of Charlie Hebdo uh, and massacred uh, 10 journalists and two policemen. They had some sympathy with that. Now, when I was in Denmark a few months ago speaking at the parliament for the 10th anniversary of the Danish cartoons affair, uh, I was very struck by speaking to a Danish politician who said that she didn't want any more Muslim immigrants in Denmark. And I said, are you sure, you know, it's a somewhat, you know, somewhat clear, but uh, arguably too clear policy. She said, no, why should we? Because for every 100 immigrants we bring in, there will be at least 70 who don't believe we should publish cartoons and want to limit what we say and speak about and what we publish in our newspapers. And it's a difficult argument to refute. Um, Angela Merkel, I gather in recent days, has been in touch with the Israeli government to try to find out how the Israelis have absorbed so many people into their society so successfully in recent decades. Of course, one of the reasons why they've been able to do that is because the people coming to Israel are Jewish. It may well come as a great shock to Angela Merkel that the million people she's let into her country this year are not all German Lutherans. <laughs> But if, uh, if you believe, as most people do now, that there is at least a proportion of this community, and we must always remember only a proportion, not a majority, but a proportion of this community that is a problem, let's go to the lowest possible proportion. Let's pretend that only 1% of that community uh, has any bad ideas or bad intent towards our society. Let's just pretend 1%. Nobody can tell us why 1% of, say, 2 million people is a problem, but 1% of 4 million or 5 million people is not. This is an impossible thing. So we're asked to fib ourselves. Uh, we console ourselves with, um, with lies. We have been in Europe uh, rewriting, among other things, our past. 
uh, at any um, historical discussion now, anywhere in Europe, uh, there is always uh, um, uh, somebody who raises, quite often, quite a lot of people who raise, for instance, the issue of the Islamic Neoplatonists, a very interesting corner of history. But this now bears an unbelievable load historically. People argue that the Islamic Neoplatonists are what we owe our entire civilization to, that we would be in the Dark Ages if it weren't for the Islamic Neoplatonists. At a recent event at the European Parliament I was speaking at, one of the members of the European Commission waved a copy of a book called A Thousand and One Islamic Inventions. This, he doesn't know, is an act of dawah by the Muslim Brotherhood. But in any case, he waved this book, A Thousand and One Islamic Inventions, which has toured the world, went even to the Science Museum in Britain, uh, the exhibition of the book, and it's entirely fictional. But it's consoling to us. It says that uh, um, Islam invented almost everything in the world. It invented cities, it invented agriculture, it invented free thought. It even says at one point that Muhammad invented the toothbrush. I'm never quite sure why they need to throw that one in. Um, but it basically says we as our, it rewrites our societies. It rewrites our societies in, Isl in an Islamic slant so that we actually uh, 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 owe our society to Islam. Uh, this is a, a lie we tell ourselves simply in order to try to get by in the situation created for us by our politicians. We then also pretend to ourselves that our values are shared by everyone when anybody who speaks to any arrival from the Middle East uh, 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 will know, anybody in the Middle East will know that clearly many things, as Daniel Johnson again said, that we take for granted in Europe are most certainly not taken for granted uh, by people in the Middle East or let alone from sub-Saharan Africa where such a large number of the migrants now come from. But we also fib ourselves by trying to change our present. One of the bits of casuistry which a lot of particularly secular thinkers do at the moment is to say after, for instance, a terrorist assault like that in Paris the other week, that the response must be that we abandon all faith schools, for instance. That in response to a terrorist atrocity, we must attack all religion or deracinate a religious identity from the religious square. This is a very perverse way of ignoring a problem. It means that after somebody goes into a theater in Paris uh, with Kalashnikovs and suicide belts, you should shut Anglican state schools in the UK. This makes absolutely no sense. It makes no sense to strip ourselves of our own identity in response to a clear terrorist threat. The other option, of course, is that we give up some of our rights. I was disturbed to hear the references earlier to Charlie Hebdo and the references to these cartoons as abusive and primitive. Abusive and primitive cartoons are something that published every single day in all of the press. I'm sure that your Prime Minister here can tell us something about abusive cartoons. Uh, certainly the Prime Ministers in France, uh, Britain and elsewhere can. Uh, abusive cartoons and abusive speech is protected. It is a right. It is something we can do, partly because such speech is often correct. Uh, but we volunteer to give up a bit of that. We will, for instance, critique all religions bravely, but not Islam. This is a, a very great mistake. And the other thing we do, of course, is that we give excuses to the extremists which they never even asked for. Somebody referred earlier uh, to the risk of a lack of opportunity. Uh, take the Zarneyev brothers, the two, uh, um, uh, the two brothers originally from Dagestan who, uh, um, who went to America with their family 20 years ago. They were given absolutely everything as asylum seekers and as refugees by America. They were given their education, they were given their housing, they were given allowances, they went to university, but they put uh, bombs at the finish line of the Boston Marathon. There was no lack of opportunity, no lack of generosity, no cold-heartedness. It was something quite different. Um, I'm going to wrap up by saying that by the way, um, not a day goes by where you can't also at least have a grim laugh about this. Today, it was provided once again by Saudi Arabia. Uh, the Saudi Defense Minister, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, this morning announced a 34-country anti-terror coalition that he was helping to put together. And he announced this. It's very unclear what it actually consists of. He announced this by saying, quote, currently every Muslim country is fighting terrorism individually, so coordinating is very important. It, it really does require a heart of stone not to laugh. Um, 
uh, if the Saudi uh, uh, government wants to find the causes of extremism, it can find them in its own house and palaces. It doesn't need to look around the world for them. So what do we do? Very quickly, five things. The first is, I think, to acknowledge that mass migration of the scale we've seen in recent years has been a great mistake. It has been a historic mistake, and we are still dealing with the consequences of it. A second thing would be to stop the mass migration. That isn't to say stop all immigration, but to stop the mass migration, which is going on at the moment. A third is to acknowledge that the Muslim world is going through a civil war. It's an extremely complex civil war, and it's possible, very likely, it will outlive all of us. But therefore, it's very important that we try to, to, to any extent we can, protect ourselves from it, to shield ourselves from it, and to try to hold it off in order that our own societies do not become completely absorbed by that civil war. We try to absorb, fourthly, those people who are already here, and fifthly, we try, as somebody said earlier, to reconstruct our own societies. After decades of deconstruction from the academies and elsewhere, to reconstruct our societies. And to say we do not have to rewrite our past and our present. We do not have to be made to think impossible things. There are many, many uh, uh, things which we should be thinking about, and many, many good things we have that we would like to keep them, and that there is nothing wrong about saying so. Thank you. <laughs>